so we can start. Welcome everyone, welcome. My name is Jennifer Salomonson. I'm a librarian at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and I would like to welcome you all uh, to the digital conversation with Maya Lunde and Peter Alestig. Maya Lunde is one of Norway's most read authors with best-selling books such as The History of Bees, The End of the Ocean, and her latest Pshevalski's Horse, amongst many others. Our guide in this conversation is Peter Alestig, climate editor at the Swedish newspaper Dagens Nyheter. We are very thrilled to have you both here today. Thank you very much. The event is a collaboration between Bibliothèque Uppsala and the SLU University Library. And now before we start, uh, just a few technical and structural details for today's event. The conversation will have approximately duration of like 35, 40 minutes and will be followed by the questions and answers. You are more than welcome to ask questions in the chat at any time during the event. Do make sure that your microphone is muted to avoid echoes and interferences. At any time, you can change the view in the top right corner of the Zoom meeting on the icon view. Now, without further ado, please let us welcome Maya Lunde and Peter Halestig. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I love that uh, your cat is also taking part in this, in this conversation. It's like one of these beautiful perks of, of having these meetings online, right? I'm very <laughs> sorry for her, but yeah, she wanted to go host. <laughs> anyway, um, I also want to say thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me to conduct this interview with Maya Lunde, whose um, books are just, uh, you know, plowed through like... Uh, you know, it's been, I've been on an adventure for, for the last few weeks. And uh, uh, I must say that, you know, we live in the midst of the climate crisis and, and it's, it's more evident than ever, basically. And um, part of my job is to write about these reports that come out all the time. Like um, this week when the World Meteorological Organization just concluded that 2020 was one of the three warmest years ever to be recorded. And uh, today, Copernicus, the European Space Agency, they concluded the same thing about Europe, only saying that it was the top year ever to be recorded. And in Siberia, it was a stunning 4.3 degrees warmer than usual. And at the same time, just a few weeks ago, there were new reports coming out that uh, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are higher than ever. Uh, last time they were on this levels uh, was 4 million years ago which is so difficult to take in. And the problem that I experience or the challenge that I experience is that, you know, these reports come out all the time. Um, and I, I can sometimes feel that they don't really reach us. We don't really understand what does this mean actually? What, what is this world that we're headed towards and how will our lives change? How will we change? Uh, how will it change how we behave towards one another? Um, and all of these questions, uh, there I find that Maya, your literature is actually giving the answers and, and reaching through in a completely different way. So I want to say a warm welcome, of course, to everybody, but especially to you on today, Earth Day, actually, uh, to this one hour talk with Maya Lunde. And uh, Jennifer, you said that uh, Maya Lund is, is uh, one, the, one of the number one of the top authors in Norway. But I mean, it's much more than that. You're also, History of the Bees has been translated to 38 languages. Last time I checked anyway, that's crazy. Yeah, so, I, I, I have stopped, uh, you know, following. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, you're probably right. <laughs> So, but anyway, um, I want to say that we'll talk about all your books, uh, but especially about this one, uh, Peshevalski's Horse, uh, that just came out in Swedish. Um, and first of all, I would just want to say thank you so much for, for taking time to talk to us. Um, could you just describe shortly, what was it that, uh, is there anything that in your life made you think that 
climate change and this environmental um, change that we're going through is what I have to write about. Well, this theme was always with me. Uh, we talked a lot about the environment in my home uh, when I was small. My mother was uh, truly engaged, uh, and but it also always felt like, uh, you know, a, a sub uh, theme, a small thing that people really didn't talk a lot about. Um, but for me, it has always been uh, the most important thing when I uh, decide which party to vote for, for example, uh, on election day. Um, and I, I didn't really, you know, I didn't even really plan to be an author. I'm an author because I write. I'm not writing because I want to be an author. Um, and I didn't really plan this either. I just, uh, in 2013, I saw a docu documentary about colony collapse disorder, and I immediately got the idea through that film for the, the concept, for the characters in the book, The History of Bees. Um, so, and I started to, I threw away uh, all the other texts I was trying to, 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 find my way around and I just uh, wrote this novel because I needed to write it, I guess. And after, I mean, I didn't actually, in the beginning, I didn't plan it to be a quartet, but when I started to write the history of these, all these other stories kept popping up in my mind. And I realized I sort of had, um, I saw four books and I had an ending. And uh, some of these stories became part of like like David and and uh, Lou uh, and uh, Signa in in the Blå. They they came quite early in the process. Um, but when it when, but the, the Przewalski's horse came uh, in at the, sum, the summer of two thousand and fifteen when just before I. I um, before the history of bees were launched in Norway, and it, I actually got the idea because I saw these horses that the book is about in France. I can tell you a little bit more about that later. But but I think for me this is I mean the climate, the nature crisis. This is where it burns for me. And in Norway, I don't know if you say the same in Sweden. We say right where it burns. So this is where the stories keep coming. And as an author, you can't write stories about something you aren't really truly emotionally engaged in. And I mean, this is the big theme for me, as I actually mm. think it should be for everyone, because <laughs> this is, mm. you know, this is the planet we're talking about and the future of our children. So I guess I write because I need to. I write because this is... I sort of start with my own fear, and that's where the stories come from. So, I mean, you mentioned this being a quartet of books, and um, we've mentioned three of them, and we'll get back to. Uh, I'm. I think that we'll, you know, keep it a secret what the fourth one is about. I actually found out by by googling a bit, but let's talk about the tape because it's very interesting as well. Um, but let's. Let's start. So, I mean, we have the history of the bees, we have the end of the ocean or blow, uh, and we have Peshawalski's Hest, uh, Peshawalski's horse. And um, let's, you know, in all of these um, stories, there's, there's kind of a collapse of some sort that has taken place. Uh, and they're basically all based on the question what if? What if we have no bees? What if we run out of water? What if society succumbs to the pressure of climate change or environmental change? Um, but what makes them so powerful also to me is, is that although you know, part of the stories take place in the future, what you describe is actually drawn from here and now. Um, like I think about, for instance, in the end of the ocean, Blore, uh, you describe a person selling Norwegian glacier ice for rich people's drinks, which was actually planned in Norway, right? Yes. Yeah. I, it sounds completely like fiction 
something an author would make up just to show people how crazy we are. Uh, but yeah, that happened. And the plans went on for years, uh, but finally the local government managed to put an end to it. So he, the guy who started it had to sort of uh, give it up, uh, luckily. <laughs> Yeah, and and the same thing goes for also with the uh, history of the bees, right? You you described this documentary that you watched. Could you could you describe a bit more? What was it that you saw there that you that made you feel like this? I uh, need I need to write about this. Uh, the first I saw was a documentary called More Than Honey, and it described um, how um, I mean h- how much we depend on pollinating insects to get the stuff we eat. And uh, it also described how they in China started to hand pollinate in the 1980s because they had uh, killed all their bees uh, due to use of pesticides. And it described, um, it talked a bit also about the start of modern beekeeping, which is actually in a lot of countries also the start of modern agriculture, because in a lot of countries they are, they depend, especially the United States, they depend upon, um, uh, you know, pollinating bees to be uh, taken around and and pollinate locally because they don't really have any, they all, all only have these large monocultures uh, that are deserts for every living species except for a couple of weeks a year. So they actually have to take the bees there and it's said to be quite stressful for, for the bees. So I guess that was how, I mean, I, on that very first day when I saw this documentary, I got the idea for the three different characters, for a Chinese character, a woman in the future who lives as a hand pollinator. That's her job. She's doing the work of the bees. And of George, who is a beekeeper in the United States and who starts to, um, or in the beginning, he's afraid he will lose his bees because of uh, this uh, colony collapse disorder that we have now heard about for so many years that started in, and got its name in 2007 in the United States. And the last story is set in England back in the 1950s. And it's about the guy who is starting to invent a new kind of beehive. And he is actually, um, he, he's sort of, an example of uh, the the beginning of modern beekeeping because the first modern beehives were invented um, back in at that moment in history. Hmm. So, um, how did you react when you saw this this uh, documentary? Were you yourself emotionally uh, like? Did you react emotionally, or was it more like a moment of wow, this is so interesting? I had to write about this. Well, it was both. And that's, you know, I think for me to find a theme to write about, I have to be both emotionally hooked and I have to be interested. Um, I'm a big nerd. Uh, I can go, I, I, I mean, I can find quite boring stuff to be fascinating or stuff that other people and the more I go into something, the more fascinating I usually think it is. So, um but I mean, the bees, the, 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 in, the life inside of the beehives were, was extremely fascinating as well. And the c- complexity of these small insects and the beauty. And I think it was sort of, for me, uh, you know, a theme, an idea that had everything I needed to be truly inspired and to, to work with the book all alone and almost I didn't tell anyone I was writing it until I had oh, really? the first draft. Or almost, I mean, my my husband knew, of course, but I didn't really share it with a lot of people until I had the first draft. But it was so, sort of, um, yeah, it came very easily, probably because I was inspired. I was truly interested and curious and I was scared. And it was a mixture of feeling that made me um that writing that book was sort of writing a wave and mm. i had to continue doing it so and and what happened then of course we all know was this enormous success and um 
I find interesting that you base so much of your books on on research, right? On uh, on what's actually happening, um, and then you turn it into fiction. So, and apparently, obviously, there was a big um, demand for that kind of of uh, stories. Why, why do you think? What was it that made it so successful? What is it that makes this type of writing about the climate crisis or the environmental crisis so successful? Oh, it's hard for me. Uh, I, I can only, you know, tell you what people have told me. And that's the, I think it's the combination of, of the, the, I mean, the, the facts that it's based on, on, uh, on facts and uh, through events and through through um, phenomena, and then also that people are um, find them quite. Um, uh, I mean, the books are page turners. <laughs> A lot of people say that you can't put them uh, away, and also, of course, that people are very engaged in the re relationship stories because you definitely i mean people call these books the climate quartet but you can definitely also call it the relationship quartet or the love quartet because the, these are all love stories <laughs> somehow and um people uh, find you know different things in the books um so i actually don't use any labels i don't say it's climate fiction i don't say it's dystopian i don't say it's political I say it's novels, and mm. uh, and that's the only label I use. It's up to the reader actually to to decide what they want and what kind of message they will uh, get out of it, and what kind of book they think it is. Mm. So. Um... I, I actually, you know, one of the questions that I had, but that I realized maybe I have to take this out because there's not so much time. But now that you mention it yourself, I mean, one big theme in all of your books is actually the the relationship between parent and child. Mm. Why? Why? What is it that's so special about that relationship? Uh, well, why not? It's the most interesting relationship I think <laughs> we have. We are all children of some, someone and we know how difficult that can be and we are or I mean a lot of us have children as well and we definitely know how difficult that can be as well and it's a relationship that's really complicated when the children grow up you you sort of have to adjust all the time I mean a, um, a love relationship between um, two partners can be quite um, you know it can be the same for years it doesn't really change that much. I feel the relationship I have with my husband now is pretty much the same as it was 10 years ago. But the relationship I have with my children is completely different. And when they change, you have to try to change as well. And that can be really hard. And also, when it comes to your children, it's sometimes easy to forget that they are very different than you. Because you, as a parent, I think you try to see them through uh through yourself and while you should probably rather see them as their own individuals and that can be so hard as well so in the history of beast for example i mean uh taking you know heritage taking over a farm uh doing other things than your parents want you to do and what they i mean all the hopes we have for our children um that's that's a theme in that book, for example, and all the books deal deal with this difficult uh, theme, and and um, I think it's also so hard because we invest so much, and when you invest really a lot in something, um, you get more disappointed if it doesn't work, and that's mm. why it can also be so so. Uh, sad and difficult oh. and on the other hand it's no relation i mean the the love you, the love you have for your children and what you're willing to do to protect them that goes far beyond you know emotions that's also part of our nature so i find that to be really interesting as well 
Mm. So uh, we're going to get back to a bit, I thought, to um, one of the characters in Petrovsky's Hest, uh, that is a mother, and uh, that I know is a kind of special character for you um, personally. But before this, I, I, we have to dig a, a bit into the science behind your books. Um, you know, we talked about the um, uh, history of the bees and uh, the, basically, you know, what, what could happen if, if the world uh, does not have bees anymore. Or could you just shortly describe what is it that could happen? What kind of reality do we face if bees were to disappear as they do in your books? Uh, well, a lot of what we eat would disappear and uh, a lot of, um, you know, things like cotton. Uh, and also, I mean, the world would completely change. Um, I guess we would cope, some of us, but it would be an extremely sad place. Uh, we we com depend completely upon the pollinating insects, not just we, but a lot of other species as well. Hmm. I think a lot of us um, have reacted to the fact that there are no bugs anymore in general. Um, I don't know if you <laughs> experienced this, you know, like looking back when you drove your car in the 90s and your windshield would be full of bugs and now they're just the windshield's clean. Yes, and I, and less birds as well because they eat insects. And it's really, the, the world is getting, uh, you know, poorer place. Uh, we, we lose so much every day. I want to talk about one thing that um, uh, is a theme in all of your three books as well, is that you put the uh, events, like part of the story takes place in the future, part takes place basically in present time and part historically. Um, but the future part um, has your own view of the future part has somewhat changed the last few years, I know, because especially when we talk about Glow, um, that when you wrote that book, it was before the summer of 2018. Hmm. And uh, it's a dystopian story where um, um, a father and uh, uh, his child are trying to survive in, uh, uh, after a devastating drought five years long, I think it is, right? Um, and that makes Europe collapse. And all of this is, takes place in 2041. Um, but then 2018 happened and suddenly you felt that something changed in how you viewed you, that future yourself. Could you describe what happened? Yes, I thought when I, when I put that story into two, 2041, I, I, I mean, I have based both the two last books are based on, you know, reports on, on, um, on uh, talks with scientists, I have based them on numbers and what we know can happen to to the uh, um, world if we don't stop global warming and if we don't stop the nature collapse. Uh, so it's actually, uh, I try to describe what we already know, but I do it in fiction. Uh, but still, I felt that maybe 2041 was a bit too close in time to, to uh, put this grim scenario, even though that was what the experts told me. <laughs> um, but then, as you say, and when the book was published in Norway in 2017, uh, some people talked about that, I mean, isn't this a bit too hard, so close in time? But then 2018 came out and the book was actually published in Sweden in that hot summer, which was uh, felt like the most, uh, the strangest marketing campaign ever. Uh, and, and it was, I mean, I saw so many readers writing about it, how strange it was. And it was, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, almost. <laughs> But it was suddenly uh, much more real. And I started to think, I started to, I mean, should I put the book closer in time? Should, was 2041 too far away? So for mm. me as well, since I started to write the history of bees in 2013, and until now, the way I uh, see the world has also changed because the, the climate changes are here now. We see them every day. 
I mean, all the the wine producers in France lost their uh, crops this year due to uh, extremely warm uh, early April and suddenly minus six degrees now. And these kinds of records we now set all the time and we have to live with... uh, with uh, it's so, it's so hard to predict how the weather will be suddenly. We can't trust the weather anymore, and and that has changed completely. And also, as you say, we have lost insects. We can see it. We can feel it. We can see it in our garden. Um, it's close. It's here, and that has changed completely. And of course, on the good side, we talk about it. In two thousand and thirteen, this was, as I said, it was sort of like. Uh, uh, a theme for special interested people. Now it's everywhere all the time. And it is in a lot of countries the most important theme when people decide which party to, to vote for at elections, which is also a huge change. And that's good. Yeah. We need, we need yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I saw actually uh, a bit off topic, but I saw just yesterday that the, the Greens in Germany were in one poll the biggest party in Germany. Yes. And never happened before. Oh. Um, anyway, w- what I also think about when, um, when I think about the story in Blois is, is actually if you look outside of Europe, a lot of what you describe is already happening or has already happened. I'm thinking about, for instance, the, the war in Syria. Um, triggered by this, in part, huge part, by this massive drought, long drought, that made a huge influx of people move into cities, uh, creating, uh, you know, even more tension in this already fragile country, leading to the war, and uh, lead, then re- leading to the influx of, of uh, refugees to Europe. Same things if, if, if you look at Central America, the refugees, uh, you know, walking up to uh, the United States, also in part triggered actually by droughts where farmers Mm -hmm. um, have to leave the countryside and go into cities, creating more tension and then migration. I mean, um, do you think that such a scenario, is, is it likely for you that such a scenario could actually also take place in Europe, like you described? Yes, and that's what part of why I, I guess, uh, was drawn to that theme and I decided to put it in Europe. That is because I think in Europe and especially in Scandinavia, we are used to think of ourselves as, um, you know, safe from everything and that this is only things that happen in other parts of the world that can't happen here, but it definitely can. And if the southern Europe is hit by a five years heating wave and the, I mean, the crops collapse in years and years and the heat is so, you know, unbearable that people are, uh, uh, can't actually live there. I mean, that can very well happen. And then we will have internal refugees in Europe. And it's not it's not fiction, unfortunately. I wish it I wish it was. Hmm. Um, I want to remind everyone to uh, if if questions pop up, please feel free to write them in the chat and uh, we'll shortly get into questions from from the audience. Um, but first, I want to talk a bit about um, Perchevalsky's course um, where this collapse that you describe in Blois, uh, this has taken place. And uh, basically, Europe, in the, in the future part of the book, of course, Europe has collapsed. There's, uh, I mean, to me, this, this is probably the, one of the most dystopian um, future pictures that I've ever read, because what, what has happened? Uh, so we uh, let me give you a, a short part of the storyline for, for those of you who hasn't read it. Uh, those of you who hasn't, I strongly advise you to read it. But short, no uh, no spoilers, but short storyline. So we are in 2064 uh, in a part of Norway where there are no shops, no communication, barely any electricity, uh, barely no people either, and and the rain never stops. Um, 
and when it does uh, it never comes back so uh, basically we cannot trust the weather anymore like you say and in a small village in Norway, uh, a woman, Eva, and her daughter, Isa, tries to survive by running a small farm that once was a zoo. Um, and basically what hit me so hard is that suddenly the world, uh, the outside world, is just not important anymore. The only thing that is, and the future is basically, you know, time gets short. All you think about is, uh, getting food for the day and storing food for the winter, basically. Um, so it's like, and, and uh, there's one part where this uh, woman, Eva, she feels like, I, I will never get to rest. This is going to be my life. I will never get to rest. How, how does it make you feel when you, when you write about such a future? It was the hardest book of all three to write. Uh, and I guess part of Przewalski's horse is darker than the two others. Um, and it was hard because I write about Norway. I write about, the, I mean, the place I describe is just a couple of miles from Oslo. And I also um, have Eva is a character that um, she has my own language. And I tried to sort of put myself in that situation and try to, even though she's much tougher than me and I wouldn't rest one, I mean, last one day in, on a farm like that. I guess most modern computer people uh, want. But uh, she still, I still try to, to sort of let her resemble me more than the other characters, which made it even closer. And I have, I mean, uh, my oldest son was the same age as Isa, her daughter, when I wrote the book. So that was also something I could really connect to. Um, and, well, it was really dark and it is a dark future scenario. But still, I also find, I found Przewalski's horse also the most positive book to write because of the story of the horses and I didn't when we talk about I talked about message earlier I never think about the message when I start to write the book I think about the stories and I think about the characters and when people ask me what's the message of this book I'm sort of I don't really know I think there are several messages and I think you need to find out what's your I mean what do you think is is the message but when I look back at writing that book, for me, it was the, the reason why I was drawn to the story about the horses. And it's a true story about how we managed to rest these last truly wild horses that uh, were found in Mongolia in the 1980s, taken to European zoos and almost um, were almost completely taken out. And then they managed to rest to rescue the, the species from only 13 individuals. And now there are a couple of thousands horses in the world and they reintroduced them to Mongolia. So that's, that, that's the, a very short uh, uh, version of the story. But when I first exactly. heard that story, I was really drawn to it. And I didn't even actually realize until after I was writing the book, I was drawn to it because it shows us what we, man, are able to do if we want to. We saved these horses um, only because it was the right thing to do. Not because we need them, because they are truly wild. They have other chromosomes than all other horses we know about. We, we can't ride them. They can't be used for anything. But they deserve to be here as well as all the other species on this planet do. And it was just the right thing to do, and we managed to do it. And I mean, if we can do that we can do if we all just decided on one species you know <laughs> this world would be i would be safe and that's i think for me that's so this is probably the darkest book but it's also the mo most positive in some way i'm going to do a short recap for those of you who didn't follow us it's actually so we for, again follow in three different um um times how do you say in english yeah three different times 
Um, so late 1890s, we follow the person who uh, rediscovers these horses, basically. You know, they were thought to be extinct. It, it's the, um, uh, some say they, the original wild horse, the one that shows up in cave paintings. Um, so that's uh, the part that the person who rediscovers it and brings it to European zoos. And uh, then we have uh, the, the person who reintroduces the horses from the European zoos to Mongolia. And then in 2064, of course, in this farm in, in Norway, they have a few of these horses. Um, so, so I want to ask you as well, do, uh, it's easy to read the book as if um, the horses symbolize uh, the mass extinction and what we are doing to, to animals. Is, is that what you are thinking? Well, as you're reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's easy to read it. Uh, for me, this is a book about animals, all kind of, of um, um, threatened animals. And you can definitely say we are part of those animals too. Uh, what we do know for sure is that this planet will continuing, I will continue existing, uh, whether we're on it or not. And um, so it's interesting. In, in German, uh, Germany, the book is called The Last of Its Kind, uh, which can also be pointed at people, you know, a homo sapiens, because mm. we mm. are we might even threaten our own uh, existence by the way we are, uh, are uh, treating our planets. Uh, so for me, this, yeah, this is a book about all kinds of animals. Hmm. Um, I have so many follow-up questions on that. But before this, I, I want to let uh, questions from the audience in. Please take the chance to uh, ask questions to Maya. Um, I'm sure anyone who's read uh, any of your books has a lot of questions about what is true and what is not. What, can we, does, is this the reality that we're going for? Um, and um, so please take the chance to, to write questions in the chat and uh, I'll pick them up as soon as there's a question, we'll, we'll jump straight to it. Um, in the meantime, I wanna ask you, so you actually talk a lot about, you know, as many uh, hujuret, like human being one animal. Um, this is also something that comes from Eva uh, in the book, the, the character that actually, you know, uh, you base on yourself. That's actually different from the other characters in the book, uh, in your books. Um, why, why do you choose such a word, the human animal? Oh, um, I guess I will, uh, by using that word, I try to connect us closer to nature because we have, we tend to, to sort of uh, put up a wall between us and nature and we forget that nature is everything we are nature and we forget that we are animals and Dar you know darwin is still extremely relevant and also we a lot of what we do are um not very rational it isn't rational to buy a new cell phone uh, when your law i mean your old you is is still working uh, it's on a big scale, it's not rational, you know, and we, uh, we are all the time, I mean, when we shop, for example, we're sort of the same person uh, as we were when we ran around in the forest trying to, to uh, pick berries. And it's the same kind of process that goes on in our minds. And it's hard to, I, we are so short-minded we are way too smart uh, for our own, uh, you know, good. <laughs> and that's, I guess, to, to use a word like Yemenski, you read I, I, the human animal. I, uh, I guess I will try to try to focus a bit upon um, uh, on, on that and try to, I guess, when I, I have two questions for the, this whole series. And the first is, why did we end up being the animal that actually uh, changed the world? Um, and why? 
And f- do we have it in us to change it to the to make up for our mistakes? Uh, are we or are we, I mean uh, hasn't evolution come uh, far enough? Aren't we? We sort of evolved or uh, <laughs> evolution the other. Uh, ourselves to a very dark place right now and it's because we are extremely clever and smart but still not wise enough to think more than five years ahead mm. so so what's your answer to to the question then uh, the question I, that you asked yourself i, I can yeah oh yeah oh i do i don't have the answers but i think these two questions are what uh, sort of um I, my, they are these two questions are the basic questions I ask myself all the time when I'm writing. But I find the answers to be um, in books. I think the answers are I don't have clear answers. If I had, I would probably be a politician instead and stop writing books. But I think um, our through one of our advantages uh, is that we are, uh, I mean, we, we know so much and we can learn knowledge. In, in knowledge, there's an answer somehow, I think. And also in empathy and love, you know, mm. we, we love nature. And for me, the story about these horses is also very much a story about love, love for another animal. And to love nature and to appreciate nature and to see nature's own value, not as a tool for us, but as it's all on its own. For me, there's, I think there's some kind of answer in there as well. But, and then that's also connected to knowledge. That's why I'm mm. so happy that finally, <clears throat> you know, climate and nature is getting into the schools in Norway now, finally. And, you know, to talk about this all the time, it's the most important thing we can do, both with our children and also with each other. Hmm. Okay, we do have actually a couple of questions from uh, from the uh, viewers, audience. Thank you very much. Um, which one is is your favorite book, the, your own favorite book uh, from the ones that you've written? Oh, it's like asking me with, which child. <laughs> 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 No, it's really, it's so hard to say. Um, I guess there are some characters, but I all, I, I'm also choosing between the different characters are really mm-hmm. hard. But I can say that Pyshevolsky's hard book, The Horse was the hardest b- book to write and uh, was it took a lot of energy. Um, and, and I'm proud I could actually finish it. <laughs> And when it comes to characters, I have this special connection with Eve, but I also find that Sina in, in Blois is an extremely, fas- she was an extremely fascinating character to write because she's quite hard to like, you know, and she's, she's so extreme. Um, but, you know, I, for me, this is one, actually one book, all four books, they are connected. Mm. In the last book, we will meet people from, from uh, uh, yeah, we will meet um, people we know from before from different mm-hmm. books, and I'll try to, to connect the dots. So it's yeah, so, actually one, yeah, it's one story. <laughs> so, so this is actually another question that popped up here. Do you, do you keep thinking about your characters after you left them? Like, what what happens to them afterwards? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, I do. Especially, I think about um, you know Lou, little Lou in blue. She is part of Pyshevalsky's horse, and we. I won't spoil too much from the fourth book, but I can. I can spoil that she will also be part of of uh, the last book. So yeah, right. so that's so she is of course a person I've been extremely interested uh, uh, in. And I, of course, I wonder what happened to the others as well, but I don't have the answers. Uh, when I leave them, uh, they have to, you know, continue their life on their own. <laughs> so do you have a take on hope and utopia? Do you have considered to write something utopic rather, utopic rather than dystopic? Uh, 
Well, I tried to put some uh, utopic thoughts into my latest book, actually, the one I'm writing now. So, uh, uh, and I also thought about writing, uh, the problem with, with writing about the future that's extremely good and where we have done everything right is that uh, you need conflict <laughs> to write a novel. <laughs> you need some kind of tension. So then you have to find uh, some other kind of tension in that story. Mm -hmm. but, but I have definitely thought about it and I will, I will in these, um, a small community that I write about in the future, in the fourth book, there will be some that, that they are actually, they have tried to base their community on, 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 you know, on some principles that are quite utopian. Hmm. So um, actually, I find this interesting because I, I just read that there's, uh, I don't remember which organization, but there was an organization that uh, just started a competition for writing. Maybe people in, in this um, seminar are interested in this. Uh, I'll try to find it and, and, and uh, spread the word. But the competition is basically write a novel about a future where we manage. I would like, love to read does, that book. How does yeah. That, yeah, how does that future look? What, what would be your answer? What, what, uh, what would be required for us to in the year 2064, 2098, uh, for everything to be okay. Oh wow! I think uh, to be in, to answer that, you probably have to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for me, it's uh, about taking uh, brave choices and uh, using the uh, pandemic to, um, and using what we have learned from the pandemic to take the, the brave choices that we know we need to take and to, to change to green energy. And also a very important um, give girls education, um, uh, sort of deal with the uh, extreme growth we have in the population on this planet. Uh, using all the tools we know works to make the world a greener and cooler place because i, I do really think greener cities are much better and for both people and animals than gray cities for example and i have a lot of visions of how that world would look but i mean to get there it's really hard when we know how easily we are stopped uh, by even the smallest of uh, changes and how people scream whenever uh, just the tiniest little thing is changed. <laughs> um, I want to, you know, you mentioned your fourth book a couple of times now. I, when, we're going to get into that, but before I want to ask you and we have another question, I'm going to get that too, but before I want to ask you one thing that I react to is that there's, um, there's a huge absence of technology in your future scenarios. Mm. Why, why is that? Uh, I, because to have technology, you have to have a country in, which is the, the, or a society which is developing. And in my future scenarios, uh, the world has actually sort of uh, gone back to something older. Uh, when you start to, uh, when you have too little to eat, you won't spend money on a new cell phone, for example. And when you're living sort of hand to mouth, uh, you don't prioritize making new cool uh, toys. So that's, probably why the uh, the technology is such a small part of the books. Hmm. Do you get a feeling that people are interested in the research behind your books after reading uh, your stories? Is it Could it be like a gateway to, to research almost? A lot of people tell me that the books make them start Google. <laughs> And read more, and and that the they uh, their eyes are open to to a new theme that they start to research that as well and want to learn more, and start having uh, beehives in their garden or or actually start doing something uh, active, uh, 
uh, whether it's taking part of a local you know organization or giving money to someone working with this or yeah anything so uh, and also I find that I have um, you know as a female writer unfortunately it's really hard to get male readers that's so sad but I actually have a lot of male readers <laughs> and that's probably because I uh, have all these facts you know so it's you can read the books as fiction, you can read them as love stories, you can read them as page turner, but you turners, but you can also read them as say, you know, almost like non-fiction books. And that is some a lot of male readers tell me that they are quite, you know, that's why they read these novels instead of uh, most other uh, female authors. That's really sad, but that's the way it is. Mm. I I didn't re I didn't know that. That's uh, extremely strange and sad. Yeah, it um, is. Everybody should read your books, no matter <laughs> the gender. Um, anyway, I but I think this also you know this uh, Lena's question is basically on the theme as well. What do you think your books can have for impact? What do you think can they actually change something? Can they make us choose another path? Have you seen any, any signs of that? I have, um, I, I, I mean, in Germany, where my books sort of exploded, uh, they have done a lot for insects the last couple of years. I think that in, in that country, especially, the books have been part of the, the big discussion. Uh, but of course, just a tiny part of it. But still, I, 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 my, at least my, my editor tells me that <laughs> it has been part of of it and also I only have testimonies from all from readers all across the world that the books has actually changed the way they think about nature and that they started to appreciate all the insects in their garden or the possibility of uh, you know the, the um, to, to be able to have a glass of water from the tap or actually started to think about the world in a you know a little bit different way than they used to and it's really touching when young people, especially young girls who, you know, come after uh, a reading and almost have tears in their eyes and tell, tell me that, you know, the book changed their life. That's really, you know, what more can you ask for as an author? Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so, uh, and, and what do you think, what could... Um, what, so everybody, just one last reminder, we have a few minutes left, so take the chance to ask a question. Otherwise, I'm going to steal all the time with my questions. Um, so I want to ask you as well, what, what do you think Peshevalsky's horse could, could do? What, what is your hope that that could contribute with? Uh, it's, I mean, it's, an, it's a hard question because, as I said, I'm not the politician. I don't write because I want some kind of, you know, um, effect. Um, I write because I need to write these stories. Um, but for me, when people, you know, as I said, when they tell me that the books have had an impact and changed the way they think about themselves and nature, um, and to see how... You know how the books uh, are. You know, sp spreading around the world. It's it's more than I ever dreamed of, really. And I am, and I think an, a novel can do, as you said in the beginning as well. You can read uh, journalism. You can read reports. You can you listen to politicians, and it can still feel very abstract but when you read a story you're actually there you are in that situation in that changed world you suddenly feel how it feels you suddenly share the uh, the feelings both emotionally but also physically of being thirsty of being hungry of being cold or wet and it gets personal and mm. that's i guess um, why I find it so meaningful to write about this theme because if I can make this I mean it's personal for me of course nothing is more personal than a novel 
but if I can make this personal for readers as well, um, mm. then you are actually sort of part of the solution, I guess. <laughs> That's what I usually tell my children as well. You can do anything you want when you you grow up, but try to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. <laughs> I, yeah. So I, I mean, we have only five minutes left now, but and I want to ask you as well about your your next book. But before that, I have to ask you. I mean, how do you talk about these things with your own children? You know, painting these dark futures in your books. Do you, do you talk about these things? What could happen? How the world, where the world could go if we don't solve this problem? Do you talk about that with them? I um, I think it's a real, really important to talk with children about this topic, as my parents did with me. Uh, and I mean, they are engaged, and I, we, I mean, we have seen that through school strikes, uh, for example, and they are scared. So we have to be honest, but also, um, you know, it's important to talk about what we can do for what we do know. That is that it's really easy to be to get depressed when you you go into the research and when you see uh, when you start to look at it, it's it's really hard. But what we also know is that feeling that you're part of the solution and feeling that you do what it takes or what you can do to change the world into a better place. If only, I mean, through small things, you, you it still makes you feel better. So that's mm. what we talk about as well. That's why we, I mean, they have used cell phones. They don't, I mean, we, we always talk when we buy something, we talk about whether we, should we buy it new or can we buy it? We usually find thing on uh, on uh, block block it or film yeah. as we talk about. <laughs> so so to, to to just get them used to you know trying to live a bit greener and of course we eat very little meat and I they I mean they're fine with that and you know all these small choices that you make every day and that make them feel that they are part of the solution as well. Mm. Um, that right. makes it easier for them as well. Actually. So we are running out of time. We have to, now that we've talked about it so many times, your fourth book, I know the theme is very fitting as well. Uh, it's going to be about a pandemic, right? Well, it is actually, it's set in Svalbard and the book is, the main theme of the book is actually plants and seeds and the global seed vault on Svalbard uh, in Longyearbyen. Um, but in a small community uh, with only a couple of hundred people in the future, um, we, they, there's an illness so that's sort of what starts the story uh, so I've been doing research on you know pandemics and illnesses for quite some years now and it was really strange when the corona hit us it felt a bit like you know stepping into my own story uh, mm. but the book is again is, Yes, yes. Uh, only this time it happened before the book was even published. So <laughs> it was a bit hard to write actually for for some months. But now I'm I'm very you know I'm writing on the second draft and hopefully the book will yeah yeah probably maybe it will be published in Sweden next next autumn hopefully. All right. Looking very much forward to that. I see that Jennifer has uh, showed up uh, again. I guess you want to knit the hoop second, as you say in Sweden. Yeah, actually, I really want to because uh, I really want to warmly thank you, both of you. Um, I'm very honored to be the one uh, giving my voice to thank you because you moved me a lot during this discussion, both of you. And um, I'm definitely going to read uh, The History of Bees, which I didn't. Um, I'm that kind of reader that changed my behaviors myself. So thank you, both of you. And Is read there... this one. It's, it's, uh, I, it's my favorite one of the three ones, I'm going to say. Um, is there any way that uh, we can follow you both, like your publications and your articles? Do you have Instagram contos or like? I'm on Instagram and Facebook, and I love to take photos. So I I like I like Instagram, but I'm not that good at selfies and uh, you know 
Uh, it's mostly photos of other stuff <laughs> than me. <laughs> yeah, well, weren't you actually a photographer to start with? No, I worked with film and I still do. I still write scripts as well. I'm a, a, a screenwriter. Ooh, looking forward to see a movie <laughs> in the future. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually, I think one of no, the pandemic changed everything. But I had three films at cinema in, uh, in Norway and I'm writing a fourth one now. So that's something I do. I mean, History of the Bees is all being filmized, right? Yeah. Yes, as a series, as a series, and as no, the Snow Sister as well, as a yes. film. Mm. Uh, and I'm on mostly on Twitter, so follow me there. Otherwise, uh, in Dagens Nyheter, of course. Oh, very nice. Thank you for that inspiring discussion about climate, but also about change more globally, about living beings, existence, emotions, love. Uh, you really connected fiction and reality today and uh, it was fantastic to be able to talk about it. Uh, I, do, I do feel more hopeful today after this moment spent with you and a part of the solution and uh, thank you uh, to you and to all of you that were also with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.